And uh, this one is by uh, Lear Lobo, who's right uh, behind me here, I see. Uh, well, you can just wait until uh, we see everyone come up here. But it's Dr. Cynthia Colon. And uh, the presentation, as I said, is Exploring Perceptions and Boundaries. And uh, just get right over to your first slide. So uh, I'll let you decide when you're ready to begin. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> I was a little bit lagged. My system froze. I'm ready to begin. Hello, I'm Lear Lobo, aka Cynthia Colloyne, and I'm at the TCC conference as well as Vicara. It's great to be with you. My session takes on a rapid-fire quest for knowledge as part of our passion for truth of Vicara. See, I see it's 8.03 and I'm just beginning. My slides are available at this link, and it has a more colorful cover slide for those of you who would like some color. At this time, they're, they're text heavy, which is a surprise for me, right? Let's warm up with a bit of humor. Our first question refers to a rose by any other name. What is the name of the Colorado newspaper with this headline? Parents of nasal learners demand odor-based curriculum. Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> well, who wants to teach there? The source is online, but I've read it most often as a newspaper. That's a good guess, Ann Vans. But no, it's not the Denver Post. It is the nose nose. It's the Onion. <laughs> it's a satirical newspaper in Boulder making fun of learning styles. And I started to talk about learning styles today when I realized that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the changing state of knowledge. We've seen some of our strategies under fire due to a lack of generalizable quantitative studies. And without correlation, scholars are not sure that it matters if we're an auditory or a kinesthetic or a visual. They're now focusing on cognitive and affective and psychomotor domains. So in the face of this shift in our thinking, how do we feel? Well, Chiksen Mahai's flow model gives us a tool to think about how we feel. Look at this model for a moment. In the upper left corner, you see if the challenge level is very high, and I talk about a subject that's uncomfortable, and your skill level is very low, which is in the lower right, you're going to feel anxiety as the challenge goes up, right? And when we're faced with a challenge that's extremely high, we get more and more uncomfortable. It's like going from beginner math to calculus, right? Not a good idea. So as our school skill level rises, we feel arousal. Notice we're going towards the middle of the top there. We, we're getting some skill. We're starting to get aroused. We're very curious. We're engaged. And we're moving towards flow because we're beginning to shine, right? We, we, uh, we're rocking it, if you will. So now the question is, our goal is to be in the zone, in a state of flow, when we're online looking at information and facts and trying to discern the truth. So let's look at the quest for facts. Oh, I just skipped the slide. I read it to you. These are online, so you can look at them in context. But we just had the same information. So now we have the quest for facts. What describes the combination of a subject, a predi predicate, and an object? Is it a sentence? Is it linked data? Is it a triple? You're going, what's a triple? Isn't that three things? Is it the atomic level in RDF, which is the resource description framework? Or is it the semantic web? Or what about all of the above? What do you think? Pick one. Anyone will do. And all of a sudden, you put down the number 7, right, or 42. <laughs> well, on the quest for data, because it really doesn't matter if we get it right or wrong. In fact, do you know you'll learn better if you say the wrong number or if you say the wrong thing? Because our wrongness teaches us something about life, right? But um, yeah, a subject, a predicate, and an object describe all of the choices. All of them are legitimate. And here's an example of linked data. Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. That's three pieces of information, right? So they're linked. And we're thinking about that. Let's take a look at a visual. 
Okay, this is from the W3C on the Semantic Web, and it's from the RDF framework. And if you look here, do you guys see on the left that Alice is a friend of Bob's? And Bob is interested in the Mona Lisa, right? And you're probably wondering, does Alice care about the Mona Lisa? Well, we don't know from this chart, right? She could. <laughs> but what we're seeing is these intersections of a subject, a verb or a predicate, and then, of course, an object, okay? Are all of them facts? Well, in this case, they are. And we make this assumption when we read content online that because of these relationships, that they're all facts and that they're all current and relevant and, you know, working for us. So let's take a look at another. Pluto is a planet. I love that one. I know, for in your world, Pluto may be a dwarf planet, but hey, in mine, it's still a planet. And it's because of how I grew up. There were nine planets when I grew up, and I had a little sentence that reminded me of their names in order, right? <laughs> Many very early maps just show us nine planets, right? Yeah, we all know that. So from data, we have the quest for knowledge. And we care about your ability to retrieve linked data. Wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to worry about Google or Facebook or whatever? I mean, I, I'd never go to Facebook for facts, okay? But in any event, uh, some people do, right? <laughs> so if we never had to depend on these sources of information, these search engines, if you will, right? And we were able to connect to linked data all across the web. And librarians and everyone had the power to determine how how people would find these intersecting three pieces of, of information or that become information. They're, they're, they're just linked data elements at this point, right? But we're thinking about the state of knowledge. So let's continue. By the way, I know my time is short. We've been about six minutes. So the quest for meaning. Well, now we're going to talk about Aristotle. Oh, my goodness, right? And what's an example of Aristotelian choices? Well, let's look at our options, good or bad right or wrong, fact or fiction, black or white, or is it all of the above, one through four? Give us a number. Jody, you can give us any number on the planet. And Ambans is already ahead of this. This is five. <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. No worries. I just want to make sure I don't step on anyone else's time. We're running 100 sessions at TCC, and boy, you have to keep everyone on time, right? <laughs> So as we look at this, it's all of the above. Now you notice a schema here, right? If I keep asking questions that are multiple choice, you're going to assume that the last option's the right one, right? Because <laughs> you're seeing a pattern from what I'm describing. All of these are Aristotelian choices. Did you know that before we started today? To give me a yes or a no, a Y or an N. And it's okay. I mean, you know, it matters not either way. See, that's interesting. But often our minds play this little game where they think, well, this is good, this is bad, this is working, this is not, this is misinformation, this is disinformation, all these different ways of defining words, right? So we have this ever-changing state of knowledge, and let's, let's tell a little story. Five-year-old Johnny loves Sally, and he says, oh, Sally, I will love you forever. And for two weeks, by the way, they're only five, right? For two weeks, life is bliss. Then along comes Mary, and Johnny tells Mary, I will love you forever, Mary. Did he lie? Why, no, he did not. At the time Johnny said it, he loved Sally. He was truthful. But when time passed and the state of knowledge changed, he moved on with his emotions. And now we get to the shades of gray. No, not fifty shades. No, no. Back from the dark side. <laughs> The non-Aristotelian systems look beyond polarized assumptions like white or black or good or bad to reflect on a range of possible values. So when we're trying to sort out meaning and trying to decide if a fact is active or inactive or however the alt fact, the, the semi-alt fact, I'm, I'm suggesting that there's a wider range that we haven't really perhaps considered. And I, I teach general semantics uh, and, and the semantic web, which are two different things. But let's look at this. So as we get to this quest for truth, 
And by the way, general semantics uses non-Aristotelian logic. General semantics says the meaning in words are in the people who use them, and it's how they use them. I remember the first time someone said the word P-H-A-T to me. Oh, you are so fat. This was the 80s, the early 80s, and I was roller skating, and I wasn't fat, you know. <laughs> so I was like, what? <laughs> and of course, P-H-A-T meant you look hot, right? And uh, and I was dressed, you know, in a, you know, a skating outfit. I did look hot, but um, it was the idea that P H A T didn't have the same meaning for me that it did for them. You see what I'm saying? So in this marketplace of ideas, we have to decide. We ha first have to foster a marketplace. We have to allow people to talk and have debate and, and have their opinions, and then we have to have some way of discerning it to get to truth to the meaning. And for my last thought here, oh, I forgot to flip the speakeasy, so my apologies for those who've been following in the chat log. So as we evaluate the facts, we're transforming them into meaning, we're trying to figure out if we can accept them personally as truths. That's the general semanticist quest. So as we face these challenges every day, our goal on the web is not to define two truths, but to present linked data that you can search, retrieve, read, and discern. So, as we move along, let's think for a moment about the women in STEM. That's what I said I was going to talk about tonight. <laughs> so I have one slide devoted to it. Over 50% of the students studying science in, the, in college fell in love with the subject while they were in grades K through 6, while they were in elementary education before they got to middle school. Now this is me stereotype, excuse me, paraphrasing what the Women's Business Council in the UK said. But only 13% of the UK STEM workers are female. And STEM jobs in STEM areas are among the highest paid positions. The lack of women in STEM contributes to the gender divide, that, that gap that exists for equal pay and benefits. So do you see how if we encourage a young, a young person of any gender to have a love of science, a love of math, and a love of all these magical things at an early age, we can make an impact on some of these figures. That's right, Ann Bands. So I want to say from TCC, from Hawaii, mahalo, which means thanks, and enjoy the Vakarab conference.